Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel this morning. It is from Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse 11 through 32, through the end, 33, 32. Okay, here now as God speaks to us this morning. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up and I'll go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and he went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him coming and he was filled with compassion. He ran and he put his arms around him and he kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his son, to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came home and he approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, what was going on? He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We're going to be looking at the story of the prodigal son for the next three weeks. I will be using the book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, 
by Henry Nouwen, the Dutch Catholic priest, professor, writer, and theologian. I hope that you will get out your copy to reread, or you will get a copy to use for these next three weeks. It is a book well worth your time and energy. The book has attracted my attention in this time of quarantine, of social distancing, and sadly for many, depression. It brings new hope in our relationship with God. Let's look at the story and at the prodigal. Our scripture reading this morning tells us that a man had two sons, one who went off to a foreign country and one who stayed home. We are shocked that the younger son had the audacity to ask his father for his inheritance before he died. He is saying to his father, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance now. Amazingly enough, the father complies. The boy has shown no respect for his father and frankly has betrayed the values of home and community. And he takes, his, takes himself to a place where all those values are disregarded. Leaving home is living as though one does not have a home and must look far and wide to find one. Obviously, the boy did not make a good decisions about how to invest his inheritance. He squandered every penny and only when he was bankrupt did he look for work. The only job was tending pigs. It was the only job that was available. Now what is a good Jewish boy doing tending pigs? So he's out there, he comes to his senses. Should he starve to death? Or should he go home? So he decides he's going home. He starts preparing a speech and he starts for home. Have you ever done that? Realize that if you kept doing what you were doing, you're going to die, either physically, emotionally, or spiritually. And if you weren't going to die, the only choice you had was to go home. I don't think that there are many people who cannot understand that. And you practice your speech over and over, and it just sounds perfect to you. But you see in the reading, the prodigal never got to finish his speech because he was welcomed home with outstretched arms and a party. That's the kind of homecoming that we dream of having. And sometimes we get that, and sometimes we don't. Sean, if you will put the painting up, and for our Facebook audience, I will hold this. I hope you can see it. There, you got it up. Henry Nouwen wrote this book about the prodigal because he had seen 
a smaller version of Rembrandt's painting, probably one about this size, and was mesmerized by it. Then several years later, he got to see the real thing in St. Petersburg, Russia, at the Hermitage. Catherine the Great had obtained this painting for her palace. The original is eight feet tall and six feet wide. Nowin spent many an hour with the painting, and as the light moved, figures came out and receded, and he felt like it gave him new insight with every hour that passed. It was one of Rembrandt's last paintings and perhaps his greatest. It's a painting that is a story of love, the boundlessness of God's love. If you're able to look at the painting or you pulled it up virtually or you see it uh, on the screen, you can see the father touching the son in an everlasting blessing. And the son, tired, hungry, barely able to keep body and soul together, is resting against his father in a peace that passes all understanding. Take it down. We are that prodigal, <clears throat> or we have been that prodigal, or we will be that prodigal. We have been away from God trying to do things our own way, trying to prove that we are on our own, we're worth something. We listen to the voices of the world, some of them well-meaning, but they're not the voices of God. They say to us, show us how good you are. Can you do better than your friend? How are your grades? Are you as pretty as your other classmates? Look at those trophies or lack of trophies. And we wonder, why did someone hurt me? Why are, why are they ignoring me? Why am I not as successful as the next person? How come I don't have the big house and the big car and the big boat? And it goes on and on, and we get further and further away from God, trying to prove our worth. God hasn't moved away. We have. Please hear me this morning. We belong to God. We belong with every part of our being. God holds us and says, you are my beloved. On you, my favor rests. It's the same voice that gave life to the first Adam in the same voice that spoke to Jesus, the second Adam. It's the voice that speaks to all the children of God and sets them free to live in the midst of our dark world while we remain in the light, God's light. Sean, can you take the picture down now? God is the never interrupted voice of love 
speaking from eternity and giving life and love whenever it is heard. We move out of hearing. God does not move away from us. Our faith tells us that home is with God and it will always be with God. We leave home every time we lose faith in the voice that calls us beloved. We leave home when we follow the other voices that tell us to be better, smarter, richer. God offers us unconditional love. I have quoted Phil Yancey much on this one, and I'll do it again. There is nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there is nothing you can do to make God love you less. We are the prodigal. When we search for that unconditional love out there, where it cannot be found. Why? Why do we keep leaving our home with God where we are called children of God, where we are called the beloved of the Father? It's our rebellion. We think we know better we can excel, we can do it better, faster. How many times have you prayed where you told God what you think he ought to do? I have a plan. It's well thought out, and this is how I need you, God, to pull up alongside me to make this work. I have to tell you, I'm the poster child for that kind of prayer. Does God strike me down when I do that over and over? No. He waits for me to understand that his unconditional love and care for me brings a much better outcome. Now and says, God never, has never, never will pull back his arms. He will never withhold his blessing. He will never stop considering his children the beloved ones. But the father cannot compel, doesn't compel the children to stay home. He couldn't force his love on the beloved. He has to let us go in freedom, even though he knows the pain it will cause both the child and himself. And when we know we have wandered, we know we have chosen the wrong path. We have squandered our inheritance. We want to go home. But then do we treat God as a harsh, judgmental God? Think about it. That's what the prodigal did. We say to ourselves, well, I, I just couldn't make it on my own, and I have to acknowledge that God is the only resource left to me. I will go to God, I will ask forgiveness, and I will hope that I will receive minimal punishment and be allowed to survive on the condition 
of hard labor. So for us, when we do that, God remains the harsh, judgmental God who makes us feel guilty. And that does not create inner freedom, but bitterness and resentment. Please listen to me, and if you don't get anything else today, I want you to hear this and remember this. I believe that one of the greatest challenges of the spiritual life is to receive God's forgiveness. God wants to restore us to full relationship. He wants to offer us a completely new beginning. Are there consequences for our wandering? Yes, there are. Does God ask for our full repentance? Yes, he does. Now in, Sean, if you'll put the painting up again, thank you. Now in says that he showed a copy of the painting to several friends and asked them what they saw. A woman went over to the painting she put her, head, her hand on the head of the younger son and said, this is the head of a baby who's just come out of its mother's womb. Look, it's still wet and the face is still fetus-like. We are born again in the forgiveness of God's love. We are born again in the grace of God's love. We can start anew when we go home to the unconditional love and care of our Heavenly Father. For that I say, Thanks be to God. Amen and amen.